Thank you very much for joining this presentation. My name is Marka van Blitterswijk. I'm an assistant professor of neuroscience at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. And today I will talk to you about how targeted long read sequencing can be employed to examine an expanded repeat in a gene called C9ORF72. By the end of this presentation, you should be familiar with methods that can be employed to detect and size c 9 orf 72 repeat expansions. Additionally, you will understand that targeted long read sequencing allows accurate measurements of the c 9 orf 72 repeat length, as well as the presence of interruptions. A repeat expansion in c 9 orf 72 is associated with two diseases, FTD, frontal temporal dementia, and ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. FTD is the second most frequent form of dementia in individuals below 65 years of age. It affects neurons in the frontal and temporal cortex, resulting in changes in behavior, personality, and language impairment. FTD patients often die within 7 to 11 years after the onset of symptoms. ALS is the most common type of motor neuron disease. It leads to degeneration of the upper and lower motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord, resulting in progressive muscle weakness affecting muscles like in the legs, in the arms, in the trunk, but also muscles involved in speech, swallowing and breathing. Consequently, ALS patients frequently die within three to five years after the onset of symptoms. Importantly, there is considerable clinical, genetic and pathological overlap between FTD and ALS. And today I will focus on the genetic overlap. In 2011, two papers were published. One study led by Dr. Rosa Rademakers and another study led by Dr. Brian Trainer. Both studies described the repeat expansion in C9ORF72 as the most common genetic cause of FTD and ALS identified thus far. And even though this discovery was made almost a decade ago, many questions remain unanswered. We do know, however, that there is a lot of variability. For instance, even within c 9 or 72 families, you can see that several family members may develop FTD, other families ALS, or a combination of both diseases. The repeat itself contains six nucleotides, four Gs and two Cs. It's a hexanucleotide. And in the general population, people may carry two repeats, five repeats, eight repeats, or a little bit more. That's all within the normal range. Patients with ALS or FTD, however, can carry hundreds to thousands of repeats. And this causes reduced expression levels of C9ORF72, but also the formation of RNA foci that contain flawed RNAs, hampering the function of RNA binding proteins, and the formation of type peptide repeat proteins, DPR proteins, apparently translated from the expansion due to repeat-associated non-ATG translation. And the most abundant dipeptide repeat proteins are PolyGP and PolyGA. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to cover two topics, the length of the expansion and the presence of interruptions. So let's start with the repeat length. But before we do that, I think it's important to know more about methods that can be used to detect c 9 orf 72 repeat expansions. In my lab, we usually start with a fluorescent PCR. It's basically a fragment length analysis that allows you to determine the size of the wild type allele. If, for instance, you see two peaks, it means that you have two alleles with a different size. Maybe you'll carry two repeats on one allele and five repeats on the other allele. That's normal and no additional testing is required. If, however, you see a single peak, then there could be multiple explanations. It's possible that you carry two repeats on one allele and two repeats on the other allele as well. It's also possible that you carry two repeats on one allele and a very long repeat expansion on the other allele, but it's so long that you can't detect it using a fluorescent PCR. Consequently, the next step is a repeat primed PCR, a special PCR with three primers. 
two primers on both sides of the repeat, one of which recognizes the repeat itself, and a third primer, a linker primer, that can boost the amplification. When you use a repeat prime PCR and an expansion is present, you see this characteristic stutter pattern as shown here on this slide, which is absent if no C9072 repeat expansion can be detected. If you want to confirm the presence of a C9072 repeat expansion, you should perform a southern blot. And an example here is shown on the right. A southern blot is the gold standard. The top band represents the expansion and the bottom band, the wild type allele. And in this case, three individuals are displayed, three unique individuals, two regions each, the frontal cortex and the cerebellum. And as you can see, the expansion size appears to be longer in the frontal cortex than in the cerebellum. And that stresses the fact that there is considerable variability across tissues and within tissues. I should also mention that it's challenging. Southern blotting can be challenging and very time consuming. It generally takes at least a week to do a single Southern blot. This is a summary of what I've shared with you today, our protocol, basically. So you start with the DNA sample and you perform a fluorescent PCR. If you see two peaks, no additional tests are warranted. If, however, you see a single peak, you should perform a repeat prime PCR, which either does or does not reveal a characteristic stutter pattern. If you do see this pattern, you should subsequently do a southern blot that confirms the presence of the repeat expansion and allows you to size it as well. Now, there are alternative methods to detect C9 or 72 repeat expansions. You could, for instance, um, use PCR free and short read whole genome sequencing data. A tool has been developed called Expansion Hunter that allows you to detect repeat expansion in this type of data. They examined more than 3,000 ALS patients and detected the expansion in over 200 of those patients, and they were classified correctly. It remains difficult, however, to reconstruct the expansion using short read sequencing data. And therefore, you could consider using long read sequencing technologies, such as those developed by Pacific Biosciences, PecBio, or Oxford Nanopore Technologies, ONT. And there are several options. You could use whole genome sequencing methods or a targeted approach where you use CRISPR-Cas9 to specifically focus on your area of interest. And these studies, these proof of concept studies, one of which was led by my colleague, Dr. Ebert, were very, very promising. And therefore we said, well, maybe we want to do this at a larger scale. And we selected one of these technologies, no amp sequencing developed by PecBio. And we selected 28 well-characterized C9 or 72 expansion carriers. 50% female, an age at onset of 63 years, and we obtained their expression levels, methylation levels, RNA foci levels, dipeptide repeat protein levels, the length of the C9 or 72 expansion based on southern blotting, etc. We extracted high molecular weight genomic DNA from cerebellar tissue using the recoveries kit from Agilent. 10 microgram was used per individual, one smart cell per sample, and we used a one hour extension, a four hour immobilization, and a 30 hour movie time. And as I mentioned previously, CRISPR-Cas9 was used to specifically examine the C9 ORP72 repeat expansion. This is an overview of our bioinformatic analysis. We use PecBio's pipeline with modifications for long repeats, starting with the generation of CCS reads, circular consensus sequencing reads. And you might already be familiar with those reads. So basically you sequence the same piece over and over again, thereby increasing the accuracy. And as you probably understand, we had two goals. We wanted to look at the length of the expansion as well as the presence of interruption. So we used two different approaches, a standard approach where we said, okay, we want at least one full pass and an accuracy of 80% or more. And we want a more stringent analysis with more than well, eight or more, sorry, seven or more passes and an accuracy of 99% or more.
We then aligned the data to the human reference genome, HD38, and we used k-means clustering to differentiate between the expanded allele and the non-expanded allele, the wild-type allele. And we made sure that we only kept reads with 100 flanking nucleotides, therefore ensuring that we captured the entire expansion and not just a part of it. And this is an example of an on-target reads. Um, you can see all the CCS reads for this particular individual, more than 250, and all the different chromosomes. And as expected, there is one big peak representing the C9 or 72 locus. And that's exactly what we wanted to see, a lot of on-target reads. We also visualized it using ITV, as shown on this slide. And again, it is the C9 or 72 locus. The expansion itself is shown in purple, and the number of reads is specified white as white numbers. And you can see that the expansion is located either in the first interim or in the promoter region, depending on the transcript studied. And again, that is exactly what we wanted to see. We then looked at the distribution of the reads. In total, we obtained more than 3,500 CCS reads for all individuals combined. Almost 2,700 for the wild type allele and more than 800 for the expansion. And we also looked at the wild type allele more thoroughly and detected 2 to 11 repeats. And that's correct because we were able to compare it to the results of a fluorescent PCR. We then looked at the expanded allele and detected 500 to more than 3,500 repeats. So that's more than 20 kb. And the histogram is shown on the left with the frequency and then the number of repeats on the x-axis. The dash line represents the median. And the median of the individuals we investigated was 1,261 repeats, so almost 8 kb. And this is an example of a bar graph. We're showing every individual sample 1 to 28 on the x-axis, and every bar represents the number of reads. And clearly, you can see that there is a lot of variability. For some individuals, we only captured one read, and for others, almost 100. And the next few slides, I will provide a couple of explanations that might at least account for some of this variability. But first, I was hoping to share some extreme cases with you. On the left, you can see a couple of southern blots, an individual with a relatively small expansion in the cerebellum and another individual with a relatively long expansion in the cerebellum. And when we performed NOM sequencing, we saw a similar pattern. The individual with a small expansion is shown in light blue and the individual with a long expansion in dark blue. And these findings, therefore, are very reassuring. This is a correlation plot where all 28 individuals are displayed. On the y-axis, you can see the number of repeats based on no end sequencing. And on the x-axis, the number of repeats based on southern blotting. Every individual is represented by a dot or a circle. And you can see that there is a positive correlation. As the number of repeats increases based on no-M sequencing, it also increases based on southern blotting, which is great. And you may have noticed that different colors are used. And the color of each circle denotes the number of reads. If it's red, yellow, or orange, the number of reads is relatively high, whereas if it's dark blue, it's relatively low. And as you can see in the bottom left corner, there are quite a few people with a relatively high number of reads. So that suggests that if you have a smaller expansion, you may have a higher number of reads. And that is confirmed in this box plot. In this block plot, the number of reads is specified and we split all individuals based on the number of repeats. If someone had less than the median, so less than 1,261 repeat, that individual is blue, the bottom 50%. And if the individual had at least 1,261 repeats, they're dark blue and shown on the right, the top 50%. 
The box plot, the horizontal line represents the median and the box spans the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. And clearly the number of reads is higher in individuals with a relatively small number of repeats. The blue individuals on the light blue individuals shown on the left. This is a different kind of box plot. Again, we're showing the number of repeats, um, but we're comparing no M sequencing to southern blotting directly. And although I just told you that there is a significant correlation between the two, there is also a significant difference. Because in general, the repeat length appears to be smaller when using no M sequencing than using southern blotting. And that tells us that maybe there is a bias towards smaller expansions when using no M sequencing. So you should be aware of that. We then wondered, okay, um, we've basically validated this methodology, but does it matter? Is it relevant? And yes, it is. On this slide, you can see an example of our survival after onset analysis. I've included um, Kaplan-Meier curve. And again, the same colors are used. Light blue, bottom 50%, small expansion, dark blue, top 50%, long expansion. And you'll notice that in people with a relatively small expansion, the survival is increased 4.9 years versus 1.8 years. And I should mention that we adjusted our models for differences in disease subgroup as well as age at onset. So it can't be explained simply by the number of FTD or ALS cases in one of these two groups. We then extended our analysis and looked at expression levels. And in this correlation plot, on the y-axis, you see the number of repeats, and on the x-axis, the expression levels of one particular transcript, transcript containing intron one b And I don't know how familiar you are with C9 or 72 transcripts, but there are basically three well-known transcripts, transcripts variant 1, 2, and 3. But it's also important to look at intron-containing transcripts, possibly pre-messenger RNA transcripts. Intron 1b is located after the expansion. So transcripts that contain intron 1b probably contain the expansion it well, as well, and therefore they could be used as a surrogate marker. Now what we see here is that as the number of repeats decreases, the expression levels of these intron-containing transcripts or expansion-containing transcripts go up. And so maybe it's easier to transcribe small expansions than long expansions. And a similar inverse correlation is shown here on this slide when looking at the dipeptide repeat proteins, the DPRs. And we've specified the two most abundant dipeptide repeat proteins, PolyGA and PolyGP. And again, you see that as the number of repeats goes down, the burden of the dipeptide repeat proteins in this case goes up. So it's an inverse correlation. And based on this information, we said, well, maybe this is happening. Maybe if you have a small expansion, it's easier to transcribe it. You have higher levels of expansion containing transcripts. Those transcripts serve as templates for repeat associated non ATG translation, and therefore you get higher levels of dipeptide repeat proteins as well. There are other explanations though, so you should think about those explanations as well. One could postulate, for instance, that maybe if you have a longer survival, maybe you have higher dipeptide repeat proteins because they've been accumulating over a longer period of time. You should also realize that we only looked at the two most abundant dipeptide repeat proteins, so different associations might be observed for other dipeptide repeat proteins. In the next section of this presentation, I would like to touch you on the topic of interruptions. And interruptions have been studied in other repeat expansion disorders, and sometimes they represent disease modifiers. So it's very interesting to look at the presence of interruptions in C9 or 72 related diseases as well. So to do that, um, basically, we said, okay, we need to restrict our analysis to high quality reads. 
Greek reads with at least seven full passes and an accuracy of 99% or more, as discussed previously. And we had more than 2,500 high quality CCS reads, of which more than 2,300 covered the wild type allele and almost 300 the expansion. And you know that the expansion contains four Gs and two Cs. So therefore, you would expect that the GC content is very high. And that is exactly what you see here on this slide. I'm showing a bar graph. Every individual sample 1 to 28. And in this case, the bar represents the percentage GC. And it is very high, extremely high, almost 100%, suggesting that the expansion is very pure. We then wondered what, what about the expansion itself, the GGGGCC, is that very common? And the answer is yes, it is. Because in this bar graph, again, we're showing every individual, but the bars denote the GGGGCC percentage. And it's not 100%, it's not, but it's pretty close. It's approximately 96%, again, suggesting that the expansion is fairly pure. You can also visualize this in a waterfall plot, as shown here on this slide, where the CCS reads are shown on the y-axis, more than 20 for this individual, and the position, the nucleotide's position, is specified on the x-axis. If a GGGGCC motive is present, it's shown in blue, bright blue. And if it's another type of motive, it's shown in gray, as a gray lines. So you do see a lot of blue here and some gray lines, but really there is no obvious pattern. And these interruptions appear to occur at random positions. This is another individual. And it's a slightly different waterfall plot because here we're still specifying the GGGGCC repeat in blue, but other potential motives are shown with different colors. The most common alternative motive appears to be the one with three Gs and two Cs. So one G less, and it's shown in green. And I realize it might be difficult to see on this slide, but really um, even different reads from the same person show another pattern. So there is really no clear pattern. And as we said, well, maybe, maybe these interruptions are not real, or at least a subset of these interruptions are not real. And they may represent rare sequencing disorders, which is not surprising given the fact that this is a very long, repetitive and GC-rich expansion. So what can we conclude based on the information I've shared with you today? Well, no AMP sequencing can span the entire C9 ORF72 repeat expansion. Hopefully, I've also convinced you that repeat lengths based on no AMP sequencing correlate with those obtained using sudden blotting. However, one should realize that there is a bias towards smaller expansions when using no AMP sequencing. Smaller expansions are associated with prolonged survival, elevated levels of expansion-containing transcripts, and increased levels of DPR proteins. The expansion itself has a very high GC content and is relatively pure. Based on this information, we concluded that NOM sequencing is a powerful method that allows the revealing relevant clinical pathological associations and it stresses the important role played by the cerebellar expansion size in C9 or 72 linked diseases. I would like to thank all my lab members, particularly Maria de Jesus Hernandez, as well as my colleagues at Mayo Clinic Florida, Mayo Clinic Minnesota, and Mayo Clinic Arizona particularly a Dr. Ebert, who spearheaded this research, our clinicians who provided these precious samples, Dr. Wieben, Director of the Genome Analysis Corps, Ross for performing all the no M sequencing experiments, Peg Bio for their advice and guidance and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. I'd like to thank our funding agencies, especially the Muscular Dystrophy Association, MDA, that funded this particular project. And of course, I would like to thank you for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. 
Thank you very much.